Yeah. Yes, I tend to walk around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, here's some more people just in time. Are we ready to start? Or? Yeah, I think that's good. I'll just pause the heat on that. Oh, you want me to? Yeah, so. Okay. Hello, guys. Thank you for waiting. Um, thank you for coming to our first Trinity Term event, which is the AFRI speaker event Q&A oriented. Um, we're pleased to introduce Richard Sarsky Hall from AFRI for this week's talk, um, which will be exploring the goals, progress, and the challenges in achieving net zero emission for 2050. Um, Richard is the director and the head of the Oxford UK at AFRI Management Consulting. He has been over 30 years of experiences in energy markets, leading the seminal 2018 on fully decarbonizing Europe's energy system by 2050, and subsequent published pathways for bespoke analysis for plants in France, UK, Spain, and Portugal. He has also worked in gas security of supply, shale, gas storage, and CCGT valuations. So everyone, please welcome Richard. Thank you. Good, so I, hopefully there are people on, online as well. So please, as we go through, put some questions up on there and I'll try and remember to look. Um, so I want to try and make, so there's some slides here, but I'm not really going to follow a structure. I want this to try and be a bit more interactive and ask people. So uh, I will go to the first slide. So I want to do just this, yeah. Which is net zero, can it be reached? What are the challenges? So I thought I'd actually start by actually just throwing it up to questions, which is for you to think about the question, can net zero be reached? And where do you see the challenges? So let's make this interactive. There's other slides and material, but I will bring up links to that. So not, not necessarily in this order with some ideas and some thoughts and some challenges around that. But you don't want to listen to me for the next hour. I'd much rather listen to you. What are your thoughts? What are your interests? So first of all, net zero, let's, can it be reached? Show of hands. Okay, so it's roughly about half, you know, a few people, which are a bit more than half, but some skeptical hands going up, I think, by mm, not sure. Okay, so uh, why wouldn't it be reached? Thoughts? I just think people, as you greedy, um, profits uh, keep going up, emissions keep going up, no one seems to care. So okay, it's price, people are too greedy, absolutely, yeah, yeah. okay. Oh, uh, Sorry, so please say your names as well, because it'd be nice to... I'm JJ. Nice JJ, nice to meet you, JJ. I'm Theo. You're good. Theo, okay. But I, I think that the challenge of whether you'll be met or not lies in the fact that um, if you look at Europe and America, you know, this sort of topic is high up. Yeah. The, 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 the quest to push this agenda is, is maximum, but if you look at the developing countries, you know, there's a bit of a symmetry, so I'm not too sure if we will achieve globally. Be able to get, you know, to okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's a good point. So helping to clarify. So if I ask the question of net zero can it be reached in Europe, would you have a different answer, JJ? Um, I'd say theoretically it's pos possible to push towards it, but I just have no faith in people to actually do it because the science has been concrete for like decades, yeah. and people haven't taken any steps. They've just greenwashed and obfuscated. Okay, we can come back to the topic of what greenwashing means in a minute. So that's a good, good thing. Anybody else? I think Just another thing, Justin, thank you. Um, another thing to consider is achieving the actual climate technology itself. So although there's many attempts such as like CTUS or solar, there's um, high demand for such as natural resources or technology just to achieve that, um, renewable technologies yeah. to actually get to 2015 net zero in time. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else that's keeping? Uh, I'd like to get more ideas, more thoughts. Who else? Um, I I don't currently have faith in um, politicians putting the right policies to um, incentivize companies getting to net zero. But I do have faith that it would just make economic sense quite soon to push towards net zero. Yeah. Companies okay. So good point. So policy. Faith. 
<laughs> interesting uh, and everything else. Uh, do you think it is politicians' responsibility to drive net zero? Definitely, yes. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Who else? Ben? To the politicians? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, uh, do you think it is politicians? Sorry, it's just I know your name, I so I'm thinking about I think they definitely do have um, a role to play yeah. until the economic incentives swing towards companies doing it on their own backs. Okay. Um, I think the politicians have a role, but they will take more than that. You know, it's a, it's a broader stakeholder um, approach. Um, employees, yeah. these companies, uh, consumers, um, society in general have to play a critical role and not leave it to just the politician. Okay. Thank you. Mm, I think it will definitely be reached. I don't think it's a question of if it can be reached, but rather when it can be reached. I think that's the more pressing question. Okay. Um, I think the technology is definitely there as well. It's just, yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it's quite a bit on politicians' role in terms of, you know, um, rearranging the economic resources to pull more into a pushing for net zero quicker. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, no, thoughts? In, yeah, go on. I, I, I am a bit unclear on, on the whole. So I think that there, we, in principle we have the technology, but it, we actually, uh, what you said, do we have the, resources to um, achieve this on, on, a, on yeah. a global scale. Um, and if you listen to different people, they tell you different things, and I, I don't know what to, what to believe there. Okay. Greenwashing was mentioned. What do you mean by greenwashing? I think JJ mentioned greenwashing. <laughs> Sorry, JJ. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean when companies kind of manipulate the statistics to tell a story that they want to. Okay. Um, when they do things kind of on a carbon offsetting flights, for example, it doesn't, the, the emissions are still out there and the kind of gain from planting these trees won't be realized for a while. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of statistical manipulation that goes on um, to kind of present an image that's more, a lot more palatable to people. Okay. So as a company, we go and plant trees <laughs> to help with uh, trying to offset or reduce, or at least, I'm going to use the word offset, what we do as a company in terms of, so, yeah, so we're management consulting, we're an office down here in Oxford, office in, a small office in London, um, and we're not producing anything directly in terms of, uh, you know, products or anything like that, so our carbon is mostly us flying from A to B and whatever we're emitting as part from our office, which has got lots of computers producing a lot of energy, a lot of heat, so it gets air, air conditioning. So yeah, we've got our electricity demand um, and we do plant trees as, as our contribution because, you know, so this is that's why I wanted to have it as a discussion. So, you know, what are we meant to do? Technology means we don't need to fly, but if we never fly and meet people, how do we really form, how do we really share things? You know, we can do things online, but I'm finding it much more exciting to be able to talk to you face to face today and, and, and see and get an interaction, get a, hopefully a bit of a discussion, a bit of a debate going. So, does, and, yeah, and what does that mean for parts of the world which require uh, or dependent upon tourists? So if you say no flying, what does that mean? So yeah, these are sorts of challenges that come on. So I'm just going to nip ahead one slide because it's helpful. helpful. So this shows you for the European Union 28 where the emissions are. And what you can see there is different sectors and where we got to, this was 2016, obviously 2020 would be a little bit lower. Um, but it, I think it's helped to identify some of the challenges. So if you think about that, when you look at that, roughly about 20% of that, maybe 15, 20% is coming from a sector called other, which is not energy. So that is things like agriculture, uh, international um, avi aviation shipping, things like that, um, ag uh, food, other land use, waste. So I think of agriculture, you know, I think when I think of energy, I think of the challenges. There are some which are easier to very much on paper, easier to do, but other things like agriculture, you're going to stop everyone eating meat so you don't need cows. Be a question about you know what's the responsibility is that the politician's responsibility is that the consumer's responsibility are you ever going to be elected if you say that 
would you, you know, those sorts of challenges. And then back into the sort of company things, when you think of industrial processes and industrial heat, for example, which obviously produce so many of the goods and everything else, whether, you know, whether that's plastics, whether that's uh, you know, steel, all the rest of it, then, you know, for, for them, yes, you're right, it's, it's perhaps easier for the moment, this is what it's like, so, but, and many of them are looking at what needs to be done, um, but also they're worried, for example, in Europe, they're worried that if they convert to the new technologies, which will initially be more expensive and may be more expensive even in the long term, doesn't, how does that work in an international competitiveness position? So it's, it, you know, who's, who should be, is it right for them to be first? How do you get some sort of expectation when you've got global competition from North America, China, whatever it is, quite complex questions for them on, on that basis. Which out of those, when you look at sort of transport, power generation, people's heating their homes, which would be the ones that you say are the easy ones to do? Um, I think that we probably have the technologies there for more of the energy generation side of things. Yeah. Um, I think heavy industry and things like that would be really hard to decarbonize. Um, and yeah, I think transport in some areas will be easier than others. Yeah. So yeah, heavy heavy vehicles compared to just the everyday car. Um, but I think it is quite industry specific as to some industries it's almost impossible at the moment to, to get there. Good. Any other thoughts, comments? I think that the bottom, the bottom three. I mean, that's a power, large scale, small scale, and also industrial. Um, you know, depending on uh, the, the source of fuel, yeah. Um, at the moment in Europe, because of the dynamics, particularly what's happening uh, in Ukraine and Russia. Yeah. Um, for example, Germany has some uh, industrial issues uh, with respect to power. They did scale back on nuclear, but it looks like nuclear is not going to go. So depending on uh, what kind of fuel it is, um, is and that consideration of course that also affects transport so yeah um, uh, maybe the industrial processes as well they, i mean if people are using solar and down but solar also has its own uh, limitations and constraints so um it's maybe the, the other i don't the component and agriculture and other yeah. you know, those are falling in that bracket may, may come in handy compared to uh, the lower ones where at the moment for is the key driver any other thoughts, suggestions? Okay, so personal view, I think transport, apart from heavy goods vehicles, is is much easier to decarbonize. The technology is there. You can the, the effort that's put in by some of the uh, uh, policies, like making vehicle manufacturers have to reduce the grams per CO two that they you know um, in their vehicle fleet and can continue to push that down. Uh, you, you know, every advert is electric car at the moment. The actual the, the crisis, even with higher electricity prices, is making a lot of people look at electric cars. But it comes down to affordability. So for those who can afford to buy their Teslas or their uh, so a Golf is uh, an electric Golf, which is an ID3, is like thirty-two thousand pounds brand new. Whereas a Golf electric, that uh, non-electric car, I don't know what a new one is, but it's not that price. It's certainly maybe 20, maybe less than that. So it's suddenly, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of, so who's going to pay for that? So those who can afford to pay for it, that's fine. And then this raises other fascinating questions because you get into those who can afford it, uh, then make it happen or they can make their choice. So people who bought electric cars, people who are putting solar on their roofs, solar and batteries in their houses, which makes them sort of semi-independent of the grid. Um, that's all very well, but then how does the people who can't afford it, the fuel poverty, I think I saw some statistics in Northern Ireland which was suggesting that fuel poverty, which historically, um, for those who are not familiar with the term, is the idea that um, people are spending 10% or more of their disposable income on basically heating their, their homes. So, and that's not even driving, that's just for heating their homes. 
and they were saying in Northern Ireland, they reckon that's going to become basically one in two people when you get the next October increase in the um, expected increase. So suddenly, in, in a way, that, that used to be a, number, a population which in the UK you sort of, yes, it's based on 10%, but it was roughly about 10% of the population were in the fuel poverty bracket. Suddenly, if you were in Northern Ireland and you're saying it's one in two, it's 50%, then how on earth does that work for them to make any physical change to, to, to their environment because it comes down to the capital? Where they're going to find the money to do that when they haven't got the money already so that comes back to policy and is it the politician's job to, to make it happen um and you know um and and actually how much do as does everybody else as society and as consumers have an obligation to to buy into the changes recognize that maybe you know, taxation is a way of doing these things uh, but that means everyone who is the taxpayers, which is obviously, again, think of the UK, if you look at the tax burden and who pays it, even if you believe that the rich don't pay enough, as a percentage of the population of the percentage of tax revenue, I think it's the top 5% raise 50% of the tax revenue that comes from individuals. So uh, maybe that's not enough. In terms of they could probably afford to pay a lot more taxation, but that's a challenge that is got to be faced from a you know, policymaker. So it's not quite as simple as just increase taxation, make it happen. Okay, absolutely. So let's look at some of these challenges for, for those who are. So I'm just trying to gauge as well. So this is the Energy Society. How much of you are who's studying? energy or understanding things like energy economics, supply, demand, electricity, making the electricity system work, keeping the lights on, those things that you are doing as part of your studies or is this is just a interest level and you want to understand and learn more? Personally in between, I'm not studying it but I've okay. looked into it yeah. somewhat. Okay. Right. It's also similar, it's half and half of me, I've yeah. studied earth sciences so it's more like Parts of energy, parts okay. of climate, yeah. but more science based. Anybody else? I mean, quantum computation and everything. It's just a very just, just, just a fascinating, interesting. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, that's just repeated the questions. The question asking people to put questions up, so I don't know if anyone is actually out there or not. So I'll I'll, I'll keep looking and try and ignore most of it. Okay, fine. So. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a few few bits up of information from the studies that we have we've done and we've made public or which are relevant to the topics. So of different bits, so I'll randomly jump around different things, which we'll be talking about different things. So let's think of. Um, so we looked at how you decarbonize electricity, heat, and transport in Europe. So we did that study that, that you you mentioned there, the 2018 study. And as part of that, we said, okay, how do you decarbonize people's homes and, and, and how do you decarbonize industry? And how do you and, um, yeah, how do you generate all that electricity that you need to do on that? And what's interesting is that whenever you do look at pathways, if you look at anything relating to non process heat, then you see the amount of electric heating that's going to be in the future is significantly more than it is today. Okay, so even if you've got some other form of energy vector being used to heat homes. In this instance here, you see hydrogen, um, and then, or an industry, you see CCS, or you can see some hydrogen and things like that. You're still seeing a fairly significant increase in the amount of heat that is being used to heat homes. So that increases the amount of electricity that you need to generate, where that's that gonna come from. So before I explain the right-hand question, how many people think you can have a fully 100% renewable electric system. Well, okay, good. Few, yeah, okay. Why, why, why do you think that's possible? Um, when you say electric system, do you mean? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Okay, so perhaps a slightly false question, but you hear a lot of people talk about 100% renewable electricity system. 
So yeah, I think the assumption is that you know, renewable systems, which I guess fundamentally we try to take to being wind and solar because they're renewable, um, and maybe a little bit where you know, other areas get a bit more complicated as to whether people really believe that they're renewable or not. We talked about planting trees, so you know, wood, renewable, biomass. But uh, a lot of people talk about 100% electric system as being, that's the goal we need. We need to remove all fossil fuels from the systems. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, just a quick question on that. Yeah. Will gas be acceptable or is that in the bracket of? Uh, so, so, yeah, so I, when I'm saying 100% renewable, I guess we are talking about zero emission sources. So things like, yeah, so gas at the moment, obviously is not zero emissions unless you make it zero by Converting it to hydrogen, or uh, and even that's going to be done in a process where you're capturing the CO two, or if you're applying CCS to gas fired generation, for example, which takes you near to zero. Yeah. So let, let's say no gas being used anywhere in the system. Bearing in mind that gas produces currently about forty percent of the UK's electricity. I think for certain industries like industrial heating and transport, especially aviation, yeah, with the, I think with the current technology level in terms of batteries, yeah. like electric planes, I don't think that's enough to keep our like, current aviation industry going. I think we definitely need to have a bit of sustainable, uh, well, biofuels, yeah, like net zero, yeah, yes, okay, that makes that. Yeah, for absolutely us. agree with you. So aviation yeah. and and some of the really hard, other hard to hit hard to decarbonize sectors definitely fall into that category mm -hmm. because that's going to be really interesting uh, to do that. Um, I, I suppose we're, what we, we, we like, we like doing analysis, we like doing numbers, we like doing complicated investigations into different things. Um, yeah, electricity is, is so different to other things. So if you're thinking about gas, you're thinking about oil, coal, what makes them stand out compared to electricity? Partly, yes. Okay. And? Easier to store. That's it. They're much easier to store. So therefore, you can store them locally, you can store them and transport them relatively easily from A to B um, around the world um, and everything else with, compared to electricity, which you can't. So electricity is generated now and it needs to be matched to supply and demand second by second, in fact, microsecond by microsecond, to a certain extent, or at least sufficient to mean that you're keeping voltage and things within the right limits. So NMO batteries enable storage. It's not quite as simple as that. So let's uh, go to a good example from uh, some statistics here, uh, which comes up in uh, this one here. So this particular pathway used uh, the investigator using a technology called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis takes natural gas, produces hydrogen and a product called black carbon. So there's no CO2. Black carbon's got lots of potential uses into the future, potentially like for, because it's got, to, it could be used as a source for things like graphene. Then of course, when you start thinking where graphene goes and where graphene could replace things like steel and reinforced steel, there's lots of other options on that. So this was saying, you know, if you developed that type of technology and created hydrogen to replace gas in pipes at the moment in people's homes, and you sort of see this pathway you see here with a lot of hydrogen being used around this point here in the heating the system, we still see a lot of electric being used still, especially in warmer climates, but in colder climates, you see hydrogen in Europe being used. If you didn't allow that sort of technology and other things for to produce that amount of hydrogen. So it all had to come from electrolysis, for example, then the amount of renewables you would have to build would be double what you're already building here. So if you look at that chart and you see the green and the, and well, everything from this line upwards in 2050, which is basically all of it, which is renewable based generation. And then you'd actually say you need to double the amount of capacity to produce that amount of hydrogen. So that comes back to the energy density factor of how much they contribute to uh, to the mix by being more dense compared to, you know, so historically gas 
and oil and things for the energy density. Not only can you store it, but also it means you get more energy out of less of it. Okay, so that's an interesting fact and an interesting point on that basis. Um, I want to jump on to go. So this is interesting. So it talked about um, electricity and, and about how you had to match the supply and the demand. So if you can't store it very easily, where is where is the future storage of it going to be? Hydrogen on the moon. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Ammonia for because it's more energy dense than yeah, and easier to and easier to transport. Well it's toxic. Uh it's yes, okay. Yeah, I take that point, but it's still relatively easy to transport it. In, in, a, in a ship compared to hydrogen oh, to go to liquid hydrogen, absolutely. Okay, so you've got hydrogen. What else is there that you could use to help balance an electric system, um, the systems? Yep. Yeah. Nuclear. I'm not sure whether that's what you're getting at. No, 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 absolutely. So nuclear is, yeah, good point. So anyway, well, I'll come back to nuclear. So what this study did, and this is quite new, because we had just completed this study, was to look at GB, and what you see, of course, is yeah, a demand, and a demand, which is the red line there, going up and down day to day. This is from like the second week of January to the end of January. And what you see there is the demand changing day by day, the shape of the demand going up and down. Uh, you've got still overnight lower demand than you've got in the day. Why would demand in the winter be higher in daytime compared to overnight? Probably because in the day, um, offices, institutions have always been heated up and so yeah. more consumption. Yeah. yeah, there's more activity and everything else. So, and even though you've got lights on in, in the nighttime, everything else is not as much as that. You have a fact that you see starting to have an influence, which is why. Demand still remains in, in its more traditional shape, in fact, is solar. So you can see some solar being outputted there in the system, so there's quite a lot of solar in it. And what you then see is people moving their demand to match when the solar is producing. So you, you see that now with people through through the different tariffs that they're encouraged to to use when it's when it's, when it's luck when, when the solar is actually producing at that point in time. So some people, yeah, so for example, at the moment, even though I'm on a tariff which doesn't change by the hour to when I'm using electricity, I'm on a tariff which is charging the same amount because I know it's cheaper at night time, I put my dishwasher on to work at night because I'm hoping that that helps provide a little bit of contribution to my demand. So I try to think about when I'm using things to maximize it. I try to do my washing for weekends because there's less demand than the weekdays because the offices are being heated up, all those sorts of little things. So this is the things I know, and therefore I make a conscious choice to try and do. In the future, hopefully with smarter, cleverer technology, it would make that decision for you. So you know you need to do the washing. It would say, right, the solar is producing a lot of solar today. That's the time to do your washing. That's the time to run the units. Um, that's the time to charge your electric vehicle, which seems slightly counterintuitive because you assume you want to actually charge it at night because that's when you think it's going to be cheaper electricity. And for sometimes it, that might be the case, and in the winter it probably is more the case. But in the summer, and we already see this now in California, where they've got so much solar already on the system that they're actually having to really encourage, which is actually helping then encourage the uptake of electric vehicles because it's so much cheaper in the daytime. People realise they need to do that. And of course you get, oh well, some people need to use it. Yes, some people need to use their vehicles. But a lot of people drive to an office, it sits there, and they drive back again, and then it sits there. So you can see this world in the future where actually when you drive to the office, you plug it in, it's a bright sunny day, that's when your car gets charged. If it's a cloudy day, it may not do it, but it then does it the next day. And then, and then you do that. So, you know, do you need your vehicle to be fully charged? Back to consumer adoption concepts. You know, is it politicians' expectations, or how much of it actually falls to consumers, or how much does it fall to those who are clever with the technology?
to make it those decisions for them so they don't have to do that because at the moment people don't think about it if they want to use the dishwasher they probably put it on they don't think is now a good time to do it or not to do it because they've never been told it's whether it's a good or bad time there's no concept of where is the pricing that tells you that it's a bad time to do it because it's the peak winter day it's five o'clock all the lights have gone on them all the street lights everybody's at home yeah so it changes the dynamics of all of these things so demand's changing all the rest of it and what you find is here you can see this great big green block is the wind so this is a world of 2050 this is where there's a lot of offshore wind even onshore wind uh, built in the uk and you can see periods where it's producing a lot and then suddenly the amount has gone down for quite a few days in fact about a week so it's really reduced to the point that when you look then at the mix if you've only got wind and solar then you haven't got enough electricity being generated so this is where the link with hydrogen starts to come in because if you've got hydrogen and hydrogen which can be stored and then used in hydrogen fired gas fire generation you then see it drawing on that hydrogen in the same way that at the moment it would do that which is with natural gas but this is now what we're using hydrogen because it's zero emissions 2050 and that enables you to give you that direct linkage between the two and the amount of storage then is provided through that vector and the energy density and the ability to store it far more than you can with electricity you wouldn't be able to have that the, the, to store that amount of energy in batteries would be just an incredible number of batteries and you've got a lot of batteries being needed everywhere so you've got a huge number of batteries so if you there are 320 million vehicles in Europe at the moment okay of which 300 million of them plus are actual cars compared to you know, everyone goes about trucks and heavy goods vehicles are important but the actual mileage that heavy goods vehicles do compared to private cars is as quite a small percentage it's less than 20 percent overall so it's actually cars which are the big dominant and if you're going to have electrify all of those that's a lot of that's a lot of batteries and that provides some storage, but it only provides storage which is movable and only side provides storage people plug it in. So people will probably plug it in when they want to charge it, but will they plug it in with the hope that it exports to the grid and they can make money out of it? Maybe if they're encouraged enough, they will do, because that's a lot of storage. But that storage has still got to be used at some point. Whereas if you've got storage which is much more reacting over a season as to when it's needed which gas storage does and hydrogen storage can do in the future and you start to see where it does that so there's this interlinkage even it's sort of repeating to a certain extent some of the interlinkage which does exist at the moment between gas and electric it just becomes hydrogen and electric but for that to work you've got to have hydrogen being created through electrolysis uh, well, you see this big block down here, which is actually what's known as blue hydrogen. So that's hydrogen, which is coming from conversion of natural gas, CO2 being stored, because you, the volume can't all come from electrolysis in, in what you find from this. Um, and then you say so you've still got to have to do that. So I suppose this is what I really wanted to try and do with some of this, this sort of reminder. So, so I hear a lot of people, you yeah, know, back to greenwashing. Or well, these companies trying to do that. So, how much of this do you feel of where we've got to is? So, if I said, is it 100% the, the fault of the oil and gas companies where we are? Who would say yes or no? Give me a no. Anybody else? Okay, so it's not 100% the oil and gas companies' fault. <laughs> Who else is the guilty parties? Um, I think the oil and gas companies ultimately do what makes the most money for their shareholders. Yeah. If there was legislation in place that they'd have to follow, 
I think on the whole, they, they might put up some legal fight, but if the legislation is high enough, they would follow it, but it's just not there. So they're going to continue doing what makes their shareholders money. But stuff like um, compulsory carbon capture and storage, if that was implemented and com energy companies had to do that, yeah. they would have the funds, they would have the industry to do it. But obviously it hasn't been implemented. Okay. So you hear a lot of people talking about green. So to me, like I hear greenwashing used a lot when people talk about oil and gas companies investing in renewables or whatever it is, and they're trying to apply that as greenwashing because they're taking the dirty money from that they're making with oil and gas, and they're trying to invest it into some renewables as if they're trying to sort of try to make themselves look green, but they're not really. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's a fair criticism. But do you think they have a? Um, do you think you can decarbonize if they? Are not part of the solution. Oil and gas is an important part of the overall energy industry. They're one of the biggest producers of energy, which is what we need. So yeah. we definitely need like such BP or Shell, whether they're labeled as greenwashing or not greenwashing, we still need their role since it is such a major player in the energy market. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think I said, well, I'm, I'm from an island guys by now, so I'm a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, the issues of greenwashing aside, um, they, they have a critical role and um, they have the, they're not the world without the technology. I mean, yeah. we talk about carbon capture, yeah. we're already doing gas and water injections, so they understand, you know, the geological dynamics. Yeah. They, they have the resources, you know, to lead um, some of these research and also yeah. fund some of these projects. So, it's important that um, regulations and you know society pushes them to, um, to to lead the change. Yeah. Okay, I agree. agree with you. Actually, personally, because they also they got capital and they've got te technology know-how and they can make a lot of these things happen. And you're right; they need to be given the right incentives. They need to be made to do things. Um, so there's a case in the Netherlands where Shell has been told that it should be compliant with the Dutch law. So we've got to be interesting to see how that one they're appealing that surprise, surprise, but um, I think that's because they uh, for, for 2030 there's this particular, is that right, most of isn't there, there's a particular requirement to get to a certain level by 2030 or something. And that they think were planning to evade it by moving the offices to the UK. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> it technically, yes, okay, that's the way you do it then. Okay, makes sense. There's another whole point like they, we, we, they, they are so, they have the technology, they could do yeah. it, but yeah. Do they do it? Because then, in the end, uh, to produce more value for the shareholders, they just lobby their way out of things and they just make move to the UK, whatever. Yeah. So then they should start, they um, continue producing value for the shareholders, yeah. but only because they could doesn't mean they do. Okay. No, no, not necessarily. Um, you know, uh, obtain or seek you know the shareholders' uh, interest, but like uh, which has some of these uh, projects or this research, CC with hydrogen. These are these are high capital intensive uh, yeah. uh, projects, and so they see that why not continue to produce uh, the conventional and then use because this uh, the R and Ds are on the high side, so you still need some level of funding to be able to uh, uh, you know to, to advance yeah. the renewable side. So I mean you can you can argue all it. I mean there's two sides of it, but there, there's no way they're going to stop yeah. when society continues to demand. Yeah. Or continue to consume um, the then, conventional fuel, um, and when the price is good, there's you know there's a very difficult uh, justification to say let's pull the brakes, selling brakes, rather than work through it in a gradual process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's an honest question. I don't know what, what the what the what would be the fair share of of uh, energy companies to take in this situation. How much do they actually invest right now? Because I don't have those numbers. Okay, nuclear was mentioned earlier. <laughs> so there is nuclear, but there's that little line going on here, but it's nuclear. Okay. So what was assumed the level of nuclear? So why is nuclear problematic into the future? I think there's quite a lot of um, social opposition towards it. Especially with some of the disasters that have happened, okay. um, I think that's one of the largest factors. Um, 
but then that's changed slightly because of energy security issues and things like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, so the UK government's reaction to the energy security was to announce a whole bunch of new nuclear projects. Yeah. Is that is that um, because well, why do you think that they would think that's a good idea? I guess well, I guess with nuclear you can produce it within the UK as opposed to having to rely on Absolutely. exports from Russia, yeah, or the US, or yeah. Anywhere else. Um, And I think I think there are some uh, recent studies and advances with respect to I think nuclear fission. Uh, I'm not I'm not an expert in the area, but that seem to aside the uh, the nuclear waste that becomes an environmental concern. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think that you know it's, it's, a, it's a clean form of uh, production. So. Yeah, absolutely. So and, and the UK government, of course, isn't the only one that's announced more nuclear. So France has done exactly the same because France has got a lot of nuclear treat. I'm sure thinks of itself as being uh, the nuclear capital, at least especially for the sort of technology understanding and making it work, even if they haven't built very successfully for each year and certainly not to budget recent ones, but uh, yeah, absolutely do it. And there's a lot of people talking about what's a small modular reactor nuclear. So Rolls Royce is meant to be, uh, and the government, yeah, was, I think, giving them incentives to, to continue to investigate. We talk to people and say that's the solution. Because you can make them small, you just go in, put put them. You can move them around as you need to, um, and do all of that. But I think the one thing which is still that the problem for nuclear is is around flexibility. So, in the sense of that, if you've got base demand, maybe that helps provide it. But can nuclear really flex up and down, react to what's going on? You know, this is this is deliberately shown here for the winter. It's deliberately picked out a period where you've got high demand, it's winter, where you've got low wind and low solar because it's winter, and what happens in that situation? It shows the value of you have to have some other technology. And if you had nuclear, that, and lots of nuclear, for example, on a system, that might make that work. But then what happens in the summer? Summer when you've got lots of sun, you, you can turn the nuclear off, nuclear is expensive it's compared to the alternative. So you know, it gets into where, where, where's the balancing act on the economics between what you're going to build and what you're not going to build, and how is it going to work on that basis? Of course, the alternative, as I mentioned before, as you can see here on the left, is again a demand pattern, and you can see what's happening with what you would have had if you have everybody just charging their vehicles when they're plugging in based on when they're not driving when they are driving, and that's the, the red line that you see gets in demand, and then you'd see sort of what the demand would be if you had inflexible usage of things like big electric vehicles in particular. And of course, you, you then say, well, actually, they can be flexible when they charge. And I sort of use the analogy a lot, you know, where's my car at the moment it's sitting on my drive at home? In fact, it's been sitting there for quite a few days because I'm not using it. So if it's just sitting there, is it not a battery storage that could be used and export to the grid? And that works for some of the vehicles. And when you've got lots and lots of vehicles and they're all doing the same, that's fine because not everyone's going to need their vehicle fully charged all the time. My car at the moment's only got a quarter full of it, fuel at the moment. It's definitely not full. Of course, I know I can go to a station and I can refill it relatively quickly. Um, maybe, maybe not cheaply anymore, but I can still certainly do it relatively quickly. Um, whereas in the future, you know, why would I expect my electric vehicle to be fully charged all the time? Yes, I could say, I know I'm going to be using it tomorrow and I could ask it to be charged for tomorrow. And they can do that, but other times, does it matter if it exports some of that to the grid? So you get this concept of how electric vehicles and people are aggregating and doing all that, yes. When we've got a problem on battery life, we don't have to the battery life, because you need to charge in this case. Yeah, absolutely. So there is that concern. And certainly when we did the original study, there was a lot of concern within the industry that um, electric, electric vehicles need very high grade batteries. Um, and in fact, actually what tends to happen once you finish with an electric vehicle, it then goes into things like grid battery storage that gets a new life there where you don't need such a high level. Um, and there is that concern. So what we did was we put in a value to say, 
there's a cost to doing that to reflect the degradation of the batteries. But some of the more recent studies that are actually happening in practice where people are doing this testing about everything else is implying that you're not seeing much degradation of the battery. So it may not be as bad as people feared it would be. So that would make it even more valuable for people to do that. Yeah, just um, this is a little bit of digression. It might be because I'm studying earth sciences. Yeah. So we have a lot of this transition towards using lithium their battery yeah. for cause for energy storage for energy grid systems. Do we actually have to have battery related um, resources so that we can implement these sort of renewable systems globally? Yeah. It's a good question, Mustin. I can't remember what the answer is. I think the answer is yes, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, historically, when people have been concerned by a constraint like that, um, you know, price goes up, and lo and behold, you dig a bit deeper and you find some more. So I suspect that the same is true for batteries. Yeah. Uh, plus, if the value goes up, the incentive to recycle and repurpose and yeah. goes up. So. And, and I'm absolutely convinced that, that those technologies are the technologies that now today but in 30 years time there'll be whether it's carbon black which graphene which you can someone's worked out how to make it store you know solid state technologies these things will probably mean that there's a much cheaper smaller more energy dense way of storing electricity possibly that's a good question did we get ourselves up? okay i'm sort of got 10 minutes i think on the time is that right good so but I want to take us just to one other thing back to um which one do I want to take us to? Okay, two other things relating to um industry, first of all. So we talked a bit about heavy industry and how difficult it is to do. So we did do a study where we looked at which industries uh when you look at the processes and how we do, you you would it's impossible to come up with another alternative then uh, where you couldn't electrify, where you'd need to use something like hydrogen as, as, a, as a source or either the, um, because you know, for iron and steel you need it in that or various other ele ele elements in that. So you can see with that refining ammonia, methanol, various other bits where you can see the sort of demand there of what's expected and how that would happen into the future. And it looked at, okay, if that has to go to hydrogen, then if you do do that, is there a justification to having some sort of hydrogen backbone? And what it did interestingly identified was, was that you do see clusters where based on where a lot of these industries are based. So you see that in and around northeast France, Netherlands, Belgium, northern north uh, northwest Germany, etc., where there's a lot of heavy industry, then you actually find that it is even in that situation there's enough hydrogen demand to mean that it's worth building hydrogen pipes and having hydrogen storage to do that. And that's with what you call a no regret hydrogen. Okay. So no regret hydrogen is only where you, it's not saying it would actually be more economic for hydrogen to be in other parts of industrial processes, but where there's not an alternative, which basically means electric, electrification of it. And that gets used by a lot of people to say, okay, that's fine, we should electrify lots of the rest of it. But it's not quite as simple as that. So if we then look at um, what's the options of some really big, heavy industry processes. So there are two which we've analyzed in this study. One of which is where you look at steam crackers. So this is where you're uh, you know, in processing and you're actually using steam to crack down to, um, to create other products um, from oil or where you are producing ammonia and you need to say, let's look at these two options here. So one on the left here is basically saying, if I replace what's currently being done using gas with some form of electric solution and these technologies exist and you can make them, but they really use a huge amount of electricity, then what you then find is that if it's going to be inflexible, then the cost of doing it becomes so much more expensive than it is at the moment. And not only that, the actual impact on the grid, yeah, just, just in this area, so that's Netherlands, Belgium, and the North, um, North Rhine-Westphalia region of Germany, 
if you take their their, their current crackers from their inlet that's being used in their, in their re refining at the moment and you convert that to electric then that means that the already expected increase of demand in that area 2050 by heat electric vehicles other general uses of electricity would be another 50 percent more just for that process and the impact on the grid means that you'd have to spend another additional 17 to 37 billion euros to do that and who's going to do that i don't know if anybody is aware of how difficult it is to get permission to put high transmission wires out and into places to, to be able to do all of that you're going to have to link that into the network and that's partly because this gas demand here that's happening at the moment is happening inside in industrial sites and those industrial sites do not have heavy connections or electric grids because they're off the grid effectively they don't need to they generate electricity themselves but whatever the electricity they use they don't use that much electricity where they do it's getting generated by gas by generation they're using a lot of gas both as a feedstock gas as a heat source and that's what you're seeing here and then you find when you electrify that the only way they, they can't produce that amount of electricity on site so they have to get connected into the grid and impact on the grid suddenly overloads the grid it doesn't have enough capacity so you will build it all and those are factors which are often ignored or they want to oh we'll just build more grid does anybody know what's well in the uk what the longest planning permission is to try and build a high wide um link so it took, is it 15 years in the end for the Scott, the um, one from Scotland to Yorkshire planning permission by the time it got through public inquiries. I think it went through two public inquiries in the end. It took 15 years just to build one connection from Scotland into England. And we've only got, I was going to say 30 years, but it's now not 30 years, it's, it's 28 years <laughs> and, and less years to get to 2050 when we're meant to be net zero. So the scale of the challenge is big and the time scale is getting increasingly short and the commitment may be there theoretically in terms of people saying that they're committed to it but i don't be believe people understand the scale of that challenge and the actual practical impacts of what this means because if you say to people you can't emit that amount of emissions you're currently doing and the options are whatever it's going to be restrict the options if you say we're going to restrict the amount of hydrogen we don't want gas pipes anymore we want it all to go electric as much as possible and a lot of lobby groups want that as the outcome then the reality is i can imagine that this industry will shut and then we'll actually you know back to so uh, but one last thought related linked to that is obviously a lot of what we've done and what I've been talking about here is around Europe. But of course, Europe only produces 8% of the world's CO2. So we've arguably already exported all of our carbon to China anyway, because it's very easy to say China's the largest emitter and it's all China's fault. But we're buying everything from China because we've reduced the amount of industry quite significantly. And even where we have got industry, we're also asking them to be net zero by 2050. And a lot of them are committed to doing that because they know that's the direction they're going. They're hoping that by doing that, that there's that risk of what the, what other barriers will be there that make it so difficult for them to do it that they just give up and just move it to China. So on that exciting note, I will uh, leave that's my hour up hopefully it was a bit interesting thoughts questions some people have been very quiet not asked anything <laughs> was this interesting was it helpful was yes, it different yes. has it made you interested in energy i've been in it for 30 years plus growing and it's never been boring energy is exciting it's always changing dynamics and you you know, I'm coming towards the end of my career, you have got the most exciting period of the whole lot coming ahead because these challenges are huge. They make some of the other changes 
that have just sort of happened without necessarily people, you know, I'm not saying there haven't big, big, big industrial revolutions to have, and lots of money to run into it, but once you got a society which it is, and we talked about societal impacts on whose sort of obligations it is, when you've got that society so bought into something that's made it successful, made it what it is today, to suddenly say, you've got to radically change it all and take the population with you and make these big changes happen, that's what it's all about for the future. So anybody who wants to be in it, working with it, advising people, doing the sorts of things we do on terms of the advisory work, working with people on the challenges, you know, how do you solve some of these things? What should the policy be? How do you make sure that the uh, people are not going to be making huge mistakes? They'll probably make them anyway, but you try to advise them that not, you know, there could be less, then uh, you know, this is the exciting time, so we've got the best time coming up. Thank you. Yeah, just, just one question. One, how, how big is hydro? I know hydro is big in uh, Norway, but in the UK, is there any hydro at all? There's a little bit in Scotland. Uh, there's a pump storage in North Wales, a couple of others around about, but not particularly big there. Uh, other countries have got a lot. Switzerland's got a lot, for example. Um, and you go to other parts of the world. Uh, Brazil has a lot of hydro. Um, there's quite a lot in Asia as well. Um, it's quite big dams in China and other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, where else is big in hydro? Nordics in general? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's other, there are other bits elsewhere, there's yeah, hydro elsewhere. And, and, um, and I know there's some hydro in Africa, different places as well. But um, again, it's quite complex when there's. It's, it's that difficult balancing act of it provides a source of electricity and everything else, but it, the environmental impact can be obviously much bigger than people initially expect. It often is. Yeah, I didn't mention hydro, did I? At all. But mostly because we tend to see it as being an expensive solution compared to uh, some of the alternatives. Just any other questions? Um, no question. It was just trying to close up, but then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the question was on boy. That's fine. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. So yeah. if people want to ask me individual questions, we'll have a few discussing, then that's fine. Okay. So everyone, once again, thank you for all joining. Since it was a Q&A talk, we wouldn't have a formal talk and a Q&A session, but please feel free to individually ask questions to Richard. And once again, thank you, Richard, for um, giving us the opportunity. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Good. I hope it was different and a bit more interesting than just being lectured at. <laughs> Good. And if anybody is, um, so Ling Ji actually, did you, you okay for me to say, you know, so Ling is actually, Ling Ji is actually joining us as a company in September. So, uh, so if, if anybody wants to know a little bit about how terrible was it to go through the application process and was it worth the pain? 